This talk is about uh, what we're calling the spatial signatures, which is um, a project that uh, Martin and I and Martin is on the um, on the audience. So as I said, uh, any hard, really tricky, wicked question, um, Martin will be very happy to to take him and and jump in. I'm sure. And this is a project for, that we're doing with the or within the the Alan Turing Institute and it's part of a sort of larger project. So this is you can think of it as phase one or stage one of the of the whole act. Um and that will somewhat unfold in the next couple of years. And the idea is developing um a classification for urban spaces through or based on on form and, and function. And I thought I would start this is the first talk actually that I'm doing or that we're doing on on the project and um it's on the back of a lot of months doing part of the uh sort of nitty gritty work of collecting lots of data sets and and then doing actually a lot of reading and thinking which has been uh fantastic but but also challenging in many ways so this is the first time that we're presenting and I thought they might be good to to sort of start by saying why we're doing this or why we think spending time on on these topics um, is useful. Now I recognize that there's an audience here that is probably not completely randomly selected from the general public, so there might be a bit more agreement than than in general. But nevertheless, I think it's good to to think a little bit about why uh, why we think this is relevant. And when I was putting together the slides. At the end of the day, I always come back to this idea that how we arrange stuff that happens in cities, whether that's buildings or streets or people or what people do within cities, it matters. And and whether you have a city that looks more like the one that you, that you see on, on the left, which is Washington, D.C., uh, heavily designed, uh, high, relatively high density, compact, connected, etc., or you have one like the one you have on the on the right hand side, which is uh, Mesa in Arizona, which is probably the archetype or one of the archetypes of uh, suburban America, very, very low density, um, lower connectivity, etc. It it makes a difference and it has implications for certain for quite a few um, aspects, anywhere from productivity to social inclusion or the sustainability of, of cities as as uh, our home and for the species. And this is not me sort of making up words. There's a lot of building evidence. I've put a few um, references there, but don't take them by any means as comprehensive uh, review. Uh, and these are, I put them up because they're relatively recent. They're all in the, la in the last few years, but this is, there's a longstanding um, area of research and, and literature that focuses on studying how the appearance, the structure, and the spatial arrangement or configuration of cities and, and the activities that take place within them has implications for um, for a wide range of, of outcomes. And, and this is not only something that, only, that gets discussed in the ivory tower of academia only. There's a, a whole range of um, policy organizations, both at the regional, national, and, and supranational level, um, that back up or that, that are starting to also get uh, very explicitly interested in these in these aspects because they're recognizing that um, thinking about this a little bit is is probably going to pay off if we're going to have to move a few billion people uh, into more sit new cities or already existing cities that will have to change in the next uh, century. So there's examples there anywhere from the uh, English government to organisms like the OECD or even the UN through uh, what they called the, uh, a couple of years ago, the new urban agenda. If you read these documents, the idea of uh, compactness, of efficiency, of uh, sustainability in cities is, is very, very core to, to their message. So how we, uh, how activities are structured then hence it, 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 re it reflects a lot of um, aspects of our society and, and of our contemporary or of our historical moments, but it also has clear uh, consequences and implications that, that warrant some, some um, brain power devoted to it. When I say the configuration or the spatial arrangement of activities, really what we, what we mean, at least in the context of this project, is, is mostly two things. 
one form and the other is function. And these are two concepts that are going to be pretty transversal to everything we're going to be uh, doing in, in this talk. So he here's a couple of slides for um, sort of laying out somewhat explicitly what we mean by, by form and, and by function. When we talk about form, we, we're really referring to what does uh, what does it look like? And by it, we mean um, a portion of a city, a section, a neighborhood, a small area. S let, let's call it for now the building blocks of, of cities. And, and we're going to get into a lot more detail later on how we operationalize that uh, small area. Um, that, that's sort of fundamental piece of, of uh, cities. We're talking about, when we talk about form, we're talking about physical structure, uh, we're talking about appearance, and uh, particularly in the context of this talk, we're going to also be uh, focusing on urban environments, or at least the focus will be, even though uh, some of the classifications don't need to be only for cities. And this is a, a literature that started, well, it's really hard to trace, but probably started in architecture a very long time ago, and at the beginning, it was very much qualitative. It was very much uh, based in, on qualitative data collection. And um, around the 60s, the idea of urban morphology was born. And with that, uh, there also started to appear quantitative uh, an analysis, most of them, again, case studies, mostly because the detail required for understanding morphology, particularly at the scales that um, architects care about, is, is very fine-grained. So it's hard to um, it's hard to scale, as we will talk in, or as we'll see in, in a few slides. The next sort of phase in the development of understanding urban form is probably what now is starting to be called uh, morphometrics, which is a much more systematic and um, uh, formalized, I suppose, study of urban morphology. And this has, I'm going to say exploded, I'm probably biased here, but it, it's definitely grown in, in attention, but also in, in the ability of generating uh, new insights in the last few years, mostly on the back of new forms of data generating fine-grained data sets at scales that we, we just couldn't think before. Um, and then somewhat in parallel, um, to the study of morphometric, which is usually very much focused on uh, what we would call vector data or, or collections of uh, features. There's been also a really, really interesting community around the use of remotely sensed data sets, things like satellite imagery and um, drone imagery uh, and other types of, of remotely sensed data that are being used also for better understanding cities. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And definitely, uh, if you want to pick it up on the um, on the questions. So that's formed. Then what do you mean when we talk about function? Really, broadly speaking, broadly and vaguely speaking, what we mean is what is it used for? Again, what is that part of the city used for? What are how are activities uh, distributed over space, and how different activities interact with each other in terms of uh, the location of their their location within cities? And we're generally focusing on on um, where these activities take place within an environment and we want to understand whether there's any systematic pattern in in that location and in these the range of uh, fields and disciplines that are interested in in uh, understanding function and, and the distribution of function within cities is is probably as wide as you can as you can imagine and maybe a little more and i've just noted down there a few that are uh, somewhat biased to my own interest but also that represent larger communities. So disciplines from geography to economics, uh, sociology, environmental sciences, transport studies, most of them have pretty fundamental pillars of their disciplines based on, or at least the, the urban subdisciplines, things like urban geography, urban economics, urban sociology. They're structured around very explicit questions about how function is distributed across the city. So in this work, we're going to be 
talking about form and function together. And, and I thought it would be useful to have a slide uh, at least to sort of pin down explicitly that that is what we're doing, that we're trying to merge these two uh, dimensions together and to look at them in a coherent way. And, but also to somewhat justify why we're doing these. The first idea is that we think it provides a richer picture, that form and function, they're very complementary. In, in many cases, they are almost the two sides of the same coin. And when they're not, they usually have really interesting interlink interlinkages that help you understand one better if you understand the, the other one. Also taken together, this idea or this uh, package, if you wish, of form and function taken together reveals things about topography, about the history of cities, about the technology that was prominent when different parts of the city was built or, or entire cities were built, about the cultural values, what did society value when uh, th those parts of the city were, were being built or being rebuilt and, and reinvented. And all of that, it, it's almost like it gets encoded. There are books that somewhat suck up characteristics of the time that where they're born and the time where they exist. And, and what we see today is almost like um, a composite of everything that, that's gone through cities in different layers, through different parts and through different iterations of invention and, and reinvention. And it's interesting, as we'll see later in some of the examples, that some of these uh, dimensions like topography or, or history, even though you don't need to have any specific data on the topography or the history of a city. Uh, when you look at form and function, they all come out very, very clearly. And hopefully I'll be able to, to convince you or, or illustrate it a, a little better later with some of the examples that I'll, that I'll show. And then the, the third reason is that when you, because they're so complementary and ma in many ways they are um, in constant dialogue and, and they're, as I was saying, the, the two sides of the same coin, when you consider them together, they provide a more robust representation of, of uh, urban spaces and, and what we think is a better characterization. We also think that by looking at both together, we're able to somewhat compensate for um, either inaccuracies or uh, some gaps in the data sets that, that you may use. So you may uh, not have the, the, high, the most detailed data on building footprints to look at form. But when you uh, combine it with looking at function, you can get a picture of what that space feels like, looks like, and it's used for. That would be comparable to using only more detailed data sets that look in a, at a single dimension. So with this in hand, hopefully um, we're all on the same page now that that looking at, at form and function, looking at the spatial configuration and arrangement of, of activity within cities is useful, relevant, and, and is worth spending some time. Um, now, here is a little bit of the pitch of why we're doing what we're doing. And it's because we think there are quite a few really exciting opportunities that we're now starting to, to sort of uh, walk into this new era of, of looking at form and function with different tools and with different um, data sets. And the bottom line is that when you take a when you take a sober look at the at the literatures that consider form and function, and this is no criticism of the literatures themselves. I mean, most of my career is spent on, on contributing to those literatures. But the truth is that we don't have a lot of really good ways of measuring form and function in cities, uh, or at least ways that are able that allows us to do comparisons at, at way in at levels or at, at scales that we would do comparisons for other dimensions of cities like economic productivity or um, it's socioeconomic intermixing, etc. And the best way I have to uh, explain this or somewhat illustrate this is is with these uh with the first line here this idea that among three characteristics of uh, measurement of form and function in cities the idea that they should be or we would want them to be detailed consistent but also scalable we're kind of at the point where the literature offers two of them uh, and you can pick which two so you can have you can find a lot of detailed studies um, 
that are consistent with each other, but then they wouldn't be very scalable. They would be mostly use cases. They would be focused on, on smaller areas. You could find consistent and scalable, but then you have to give up on, on the amount of detail that you can that you can look. And then detail and scalable is a little trickier, but if you I suppose if you take together all of the use cases that have been contributed over the years, they do add up to a scale. The problem is that it's really hard to to compare across each other because they're they're focused on different data sets, they're focused with slightly different measurements, um, uh, etc. And the result of this is that it's generating a lot of understanding. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't know anything or that we don't have any way of measuring form and function in cities, but a lot of what we know is relatively fragmented and it, it's hard to know whether it holds in other places, it's hard to know how well it scales, and it's also hard to know what the full picture is if we were able to put it all all together. And I suppose in a more applied and pragmatic view, what we're trying to do with, with this project is, is, well, in a way, conceptually getting around or providing a, a, a way of thinking or, or a framework to try to make the best of the current technology and data sets that are available to somewhat being able to pick the three of those three rather than only two. Um, at a more pragmatic level, I suppose what we're trying to do is somewhat fill this gap in between that we feel exists in between, on the one hand, land use, land cover classifications, which are in some ways fairly detailed in terms of geographical resolution. Um, they're very scalable because a lot of them are based on, on remotely sensed um, data that scales globally and in a consistent way but that are really not focused on, on cities. The best illustration I have for this is Marty and I were doing some work the other week on, on the Korean land cover classification, which is a, a land cover and land use classification for, for Europe that the European Space Agency um, generates. And out of 37 categories, I think, if you really stretch the definition of what could be found or could be used for understanding cities, five of those categories um, would really fall within within these within the urban domain, right? Think like uh, continuous development, non-continuous development, industrial, retail, and a couple others. Out of 37, everything else is, you know, if you're interested in forestry, you have five different categories. If you're interested in marshes, they have three different ones, etc. And this reflects just the fact that these ca classifications are not built to understand cities. It's almost like they're built to understand everything that is not a city. And once they get to the to the city boundary, they say, well, OK, yeah, this is a city, but that's it. That's not what we're doing this for. So on the one hand, there's a lot of work on that on that area and the land use and land cover. And then on the other hand, there's also a very long lineage, particularly in the UK, around geodemographic classification, understanding places by the people who live there, or understanding the people, or understanding the population by where they live um, at the neighborhood level. However, those are classifications around the people who live there, not necessarily about the characteristics and the and the nature of the urban space where they live. And we think as we, as I just mentioned in the previous slides, that there is room for, and a need also for, for developing uh, new classifications or new ways of, of conceptualizing how we understand urban environments or how we divide space or partition space um, with a focus on understanding cities rather than understanding everything that is not a city. And this is really why we're, we're uh, developing this idea that we're calling the, the spatial signatures, which you know, is a fairly general term and, and probably uh, not everyone would love, but we had to pick one. And, and to some extent, we think it, it's useful and it captures some of the essence of what we're trying, trying to get. So what are spatial signatures? Um, they're a characterization of space based on form and function designed to understand urban environments. This is... This is the elevator pitch of what the, the spatial signatures are. And let me unpack this a little bit more uh, for you to get to focus and to uh, put the spotlight on, on a couple of key elements that, 
that are really uh, guiding our our development of the of the spatial signatures. The first one is that they're a characterization of space. So what we're doing here is a delineating boundaries across the geography, and this is important. We'll see later how we figure this out, but this is important that we're trying to create an exhaustive delineation and partition of of space, uh, and and that will drive some of the decisions that we do later. And also we're doing that to come up with categories. We, we're trying to build a typology of um, how space is divided when you consider form and function. And in particular, when you consider those two with the focus on, on cities. Whoops. The second one is that it's it's based on, on form and function. It, it places uh, the the spotlight, it, it focuses particularly on understanding this interaction and this combination of form, of morphology and, and function. What are the different uses and, and what are the uh, different activities that, that come together in, in a particular context, geographic context? I am pressing the right arrow way more than I, than I should rather than the down arrow. And then the final one is Something that might seem obvious, but as I was saying a slide ago, it isn't, is that we're creating a classification that tries to divide the geography in an exhaustive way, but that is focused on understanding urban environments. This is to say that in a way you can almost think of a land use classification like Korean, but flipped around. There might be some classes that will not relate necessarily to cities, but those will be the minority because our focus is very much understanding the built environment and the activities that take place within that, that built environment. So this is a fairly general um, you know, definition in a way necessary because that's what we're what we're what we're trying to do is is fairly wide reaching. How are we developing, what's the process of developing um, the spatial signatures? And I'm going to cover it at this stage at a fairly conceptual level because I want to highlight the idea that we're not developing this for any one type, any one classification. We're not thinking, when we do this, we're not thinking of the UK, we're not thinking of the US, we're not thinking of Europe. We're thinking of how can we think about form and function to delineate a, a set of boundaries really for um, for the geography. And because we also want to, to make clear that you can think about spatial signatures at a conceptual level, which is what I'm doing now, and then land that conceptual understanding at a much more pragmatic one, depending on the different um, context that you're interested in. So later I'll show you an illustration with a few cities that hopefully will show you that this concept is pretty uh, versatile and repurposable for, for a wide variety of contexts. So for now, bear with me, even though it might still sound a little bit um, a little bit abstract. So the process of building spatial signatures, and I should have said that by signatures we mean both the the typology, the categorization, as well as each uh, each of those. So each category, but also the areas that we're de delineating. So you, we can say that the spatial sig or one of the spatial signatures might be one of these categories we're developing. But then when we delineate a portion of space that is contiguous and delineated uh, through this process, then we will also call that a signature, a spatial signature. So how do we uh, build these? It's based on a process of uh, three stages. The first one is what we're calling now the enclosed tessellation, which is basically the division or the partition of space into what we call the atomic units, the, the smallest possible units you can think of that you can then put together almost as if they were leg Lego blocks to build these, these signatures. Then once we have these, these areas, we embed form and function by uh, by creating or building a set of characters that uh, describe their different aspects of their form and, and their function. And then once we have those characters attached to uh, the enclosed tessellation cells, as we'll call these, these units, we uh, cluster them or we feed them to an algorithm that will give us this typology. So I'm not going to tell you how 
many minutes I spent putting together this slide, I'm extremely proud of. And hopefully it, it doesn't only look pretty, but it, it's somewhat useful uh, to understand the idea. On the top here, you can see um, it, there's a flag for uh, the state on which there's there's quite a bit of steps that that go that, I, that I've divided or we've divided this up for you to hopefully understand this a little better. And on the on the top line here, they'll uh, they'll appear the names that we're calling each of these steps somewhat, so you can see where we are. Um, and if you're bored, also just know that the state stages will finish here, so you can see you can think of this almost as a progress bar. The first one is coming up with what we call barriers or delimiters, and these may be uh, several layers. So <clears throat> the idea of starting to, to think about a partition of space through delimiters or barriers is, is relatively intuitive and is grounded on, on a lot of literature that goes back all the way for, at the very least to the 60s with the, the image of the city of David Lynch and, and other, other works. But if you just to pick on, on the image of the city a little more, it's a tiny, uh, lovely book um, by David Lynch around how people perceive urban spaces and, and what are the, the main building blocks that we can use to understand how people read cities. And it, it boils down to just a handful of them. One of them is this idea of, of barriers or the delimit limiters of space, things that cannot be crossed that somewhat enclose uh, space. So I'm making the, the specific point here that this could be more than one uh, layer because you can think of the limiters um, you can think of several types of delimiters. You can think of the most obvious one is probably street networks, but also railways delimit space and rivers delimit space. And depending on the context, uh, mountain ranges may delimit space or cliffs may delimit space and so on. So at the first stage, we think of all the possible elements that we can bring together to um, to create this part this initial partitions that we will call then uh, enclosures. So once you sort of melt all of these layers into a single one that takes almost, you put a, one layer on top of each other, almost like a cookie cutter, then the the smallest units that result from these, we will call um, enclosures. Now, enclosures may be uh, very small, like, a, like they will be at the city center of a dense, compact city. But they could also be very large, as they could be in the middle of the countryside, where the delineation between rivers and, and uh, roads and, and trails may still live inside the enclosure really large spaces. And also, even in cities, those spaces may contain different things. So you may think of a block at the city center that may contain uh, two buildings that are very, very different. One of them may be residential, another one may be um, services. So. Then we bring this together with um, what we call anchors, or uh, which in, in our cases will be mostly building footprints, but you could maybe think of other uh, layers that are also understood as, as anchors. And through this process that we call the uh, morphological tessellation, and this is very much uh, drawn from, from Martin's expertise, is a paper uh, from last year. What we do is, further subdivide the enclosures in a way that we're building. You can think of almost uh, the morphological tessellation is a Voronoi tessellation. So you're basically delimiting space in a way that apportions every point in space to the nearest, in our case, anchor, so uh, building footprints. And then these, these two together, when you put together the enclosures that delimit these tessellations with the morphological tessellations, we come up with what we call the uh, enclosed tessellation. So in this uh, graphic, what we see is in, in blue would be what originally was uh, the limiter, so it might be the street network, but then inside each enclosure, there might be more than one anchor, and then those anchors are used to sub subdivide um, the space into smaller, even uh, more granular and uh, areas that we call enclosed tessellation cells because they're the output of the enclosed tessellation process. Okay, so this is the first main pillar. 
for building signatures. It's a really important one because even though it may seem like we haven't even started bringing any form or function data, so to speak, at this stage, we need to get it right because it's, it's defining what is the smallest possible unit that you may want to divide space to really understand form and function. So what we're going to be doing from now on is trying is try to grow areas that are collections or sets of enclosed tessellation cells that are linked to each other or that are grouped because they're similar um, in their form and function characteristics. So to do that, it comes the process of building the or developing characters for each enclosed tessellation. And here we have two potential types of layers, one for form, where you can think of all sorts of metrics and uh, scores and indices that tell that tell us thing things about um, the morphology of of a tessellation cell, but also of its context. So, whether it's in a dense uh, or in a highly interconnected or or uh, highly regular grid of streets, whether the uh, building footprints are um, follow a particular pattern, they take most of the tessellation, they take a, a small part actually, uh, or or other characteristics. And I have a slide on this later, so uh, we'll, we'll talk ad, about this a little bit more. The point of this stage is that we're enriching each of these newly created small units, these enclosed tessellation cells, with a lot of information about what they look like, what they're used for, and also what their immediate context is uh, used for and, and looks like. And this is building a highly multidimensional data set that tells us things about each of these um, small atomic units. Then the final step is uh, the clustering stage where we're using all of these characters, all of these uh, attributes of each tessellation cell to fit them into a clustering algorithm. That is to find groups categories or types of uh, cells that have uh, similar traits or, or that present a similar nature along the all of the dimensions of form and function that we've uh, derived in the in the previous stage and this gives us uh, here we're representing it with a with different colors and, and the idea is that different colors represent um, areas that have that have been clustered together. Now, a lot of those will probably be, because we know this is how, how cities work and how form and function is distributed, they will be contiguous. You, is, is rare or is, is relatively uncommon that a, a single cell at this level of granularity will be very different from everything that happens in its surroundings. So the last stage of going from these classes of cells to the signatures is dissolving uh, cells that are next to each other, so that are contiguous, and are also grouped into the same category. And then once you you go through this stage, you arrive at a delineation of space that is based on something that's highly granular, but it tells us about how form and function is distributed and how it's how it partitions the geography. So, whoops. So when you put it together, you go from coming up with barriers, merging those barriers with anchors inside the barriers, the in, inside what we then call the enclosures, to then generate the enclosed tessellation cells, which represent the, the smallest possible unit at which we can study um, or at, at which we decide to study uh, form and function. Then you attach a lot of information about form and function for each of those units and you pass them through a, a classification algorithm that groups them into categories of uh, cells that are similar, which you then blend or melt their boundaries to arrive at what we call then the, the spatial signatures. A quick note on the characters. Uh, these are form and function. As I said, form relates to uh, characteristics of the building footprints. As I was saying, their regularity, their size, their size to, uh, to in relationship to its immediate area, etc. 
Others relate to the characteristics of the cell, the shape, the compactness, the uh, uh, the extent to which it's filled by the building uh, or not, um, and so on. Others relate to the street segment in which the uh, the cell is embedded, so the, they bring in uh, aspects of the street layout. And then once we have a, a load of characteristics for a particular cell, we also grow the uh, sort of hyperlocal context to bring together the nature of the cells that are surrounding it. Because the idea is that when you're talking about form and function within cities, nothing is um, atomic in itself. You, you can't understand a single cell without understanding with what, what surround it, surrounds it. And when it comes to function, we're bringing in here information on land use and land cover. So some of those uh, few types that do help us understand cities a little bit in land use uh, classifications. We're bringing access to uses. Again, we're trying to understand the cell not as only as what happens within the cell, but where that cell is also in the broader context of, of the city. And then we're also trying to understand uh, different intensity of uh, different activities or the intensity of different activities by looking at, at densities. So what are the, the benefits of, um, of this approach? This is broadly speaking the conceptual explanation of what are the spatial signatures and how do you arrive to those uh, from, the, from the ground up. We think that this is basically we think this is the best thing since sliced bread. We think there's a lot of really good things that uh, doing these can can bring together. Most of those coalesce around these three key key benefits. The first one is that, on the one hand, is data driven. is entirely uh, is a delineation. You you come up with the categories without saying ex ante. I'm looking for sprawl or I'm looking for compactness. You say you instead bring together aspects of form and function that different literatures and different theories have highlighted as useful, but then you encode those into data sets that you put together. And, and the idea here is that um, you can let the data speak, but always guide it through through theory, right? And and not through one theory, but, a, but by a, a kaleidoscope, if you wish, of, of interdisciplinary theories. The second one is that they they kind of are like they allow you to have the cake and, and eat it. They're very granular because they're based on on the smallest possible unit that we could think that makes sense for understanding form and function, which are the enclosed isolation cells. But then they can be there's nothing that precludes you from growing these at a very, very large scale, particularly uh when when you think of some of the new data sets that are coming on stream in terms of uh, building footprints at the national level or uh, continental street networks, etc. And because of these two, these previous two, they're a very flexible and versatile concept that can be deployed in a variety of contexts. So you can you can think of, and I'll show you that in, in a second with the illustration, you can think of uh, developing spatial signatures in a, in the context of a uh, of a geography that is very data rich and the more data you have the more accurate descriptions and characterizations you're going to be able to to do and the method allows you to bring the more the better but also because it exploits these um interconnections between form and function that come together in cities it can work well even if you don't have a lot of a lot of uh data richness. Of course, it you can't do anything if you don't have any data, because at the end of the day, it is a data-driven approach. But it doesn't have to have, it It kind of gets around in some ways, some of the problems that I was mentioning before of the early, uh, more architecture-based studies that, that require super, super highly granular data sets. Okay, so enough of, of concepts and abstract stuff. Uh, I figured that this is most of the core message that I wanted to deliver. And then what I'm going to do in this last part of the talk is walk you through an illustration with a few cities to give you a feel at least for what what this looks like when you actually deploy it on, on, on real world cities, but also of its versatility and, and how, even though this is an illustration, it can 
it can help you gain insights and it can it can help you learn things about cities or confirm cities or confirm things that you we already know but that it, they're picked up without feeding directly um uh information about those those aspects so here is the setup we we picked five different uh cities and actually i'm just realizing that they are no they're five sorry i was gonna say they're six they're not they're five uh the what we were going is for getting a large variation across almost any dimension that we could think of so we have cities with very different historical backgrounds very different uh sizes very different geographies and geographical locations so there's cattle all, all over the the world uh, but they're also located in very different places you go from places from uh, paper flat terrain to very very uh, rugged um, terrain in the in a small valley they are cities that uh, have been developed by substantially different societies and and cultures and that will come through in in the characters and the nature that we that our signatures are picking up and they're also reflecting this idea that you don't need to have super highly uh accurate data sets to um to develop spatial signatures so some of them are based on cities that have amazing open data portals and and we make the most of those but others are based on on uh, data landscapes that are much more uh, limited so and hopefully we'll I'll, I'll get to show you that you can still learn quite a bit about the distribution of form and function uh, in those cases so here are the the cities uh, we picked Barcelona in in Spain uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in in South uh, Eastern Africa we picked Houston in the US, uh, Medellin in Colombia, and Singapore, uh, the city-state in, in Southeast Asia. Again, hopefully you can get the, the breath already from a traditional, not traditional, from a one of the archetype uh, European sort of long-standing cities, very old, uh, with a lot of different cultures and waves of, of history coming through it. Uh, we picked a um, developing country city like Dar es Salaam we picked an archetype of uh, urban sprawl or the post-World War II type of cities in in Houston we picked a Latin American city uh, in a very particular uh, mountainous or rugged terrain like Medellin and and then Singapore is an example of um, colonial um, colonial city in in Southeast Asia so what's the data that we picked? It, it varies by city. This is, so I'm not going to go, I think every, Martin can probably provide the exact number, but e every city we have at least about 80 to 100 different characters that we derive for for uh, the cells based on a variety of data sets. But broadly speaking, the strategy that we, that we go with is this one for form. We rely, if there is a local, open data portal that provides official say cadaster building footprints like it's a case in in medellin or in barcelona that's great uh if not we go for things like open street map which in dar es salaam for example is fantastically good um, and in other cases we use some of the more modern satellite derived data sets like in houston we use the microsoft uh, building footprints data set and then for function is also a, a hodgepodge of different sources that we can source and we can use in, in each of the cities. So when possible and available, like in Barcelona, we use pretty heavily the uh, open data portals of the city because they rely on national statistics, but then also the statistics that the municipality um, generates only for the city. And, and they provide probably the richest case or the richest example of of detail and and granularity uh, where we, that's not available we rely on on larger uh, land use classifications like the land cover uh, land use and land cover classification in in the us or a bit of korean um in in barcelona and we also rely on global grids like the global human layer uh, gl global human settlement layer for things like population uh population counts we try to approximate uh where that's the only thing available the presence of or the intensity of ac activity human activity and or economic activity with nightlight data 
as well where that's that's possible well that's possible everywhere where when where no, nothing else is is possible and once we bring all of this together remember that whoops uh we're bringing that that's how we built all of these layers right effectively the the ones for form and the ones for function then we bring all of these in this case we go for a relatively widely uh, acceptable and, and popular k-means algorithm and we pick the number of clusters per city so we don't do a clustering for the whole thing we we do an exercise it's, it's five use cases effectively uh, and we do this because in itself the number of clusters that we find most suitable through uh, cluster gram visualizations and, and related methods it already tells us something about the the nature of of signatures in that city so here are the the five signatures and i'm going to show you a couple of highlights that we find i should also say that this is very much work in progress i should have said at the very beginning this is very much work in progress so this is uh out of the oven and we're still sort of working through what the results mean at a deeper level but i think hopefully what, what we're uh showing you is is useful and interesting enough um that you'll find it worth worth listening to so let me start with barcelona the uh here what you have is on the left the signatures that we identify if you're familiar with barcelona you can start trying to read it and a lot of uh, hopefully a lot of uh, useful suspects will show up, but then also others that, that maybe uh, are not as, as obvious. And then on the right is the same classification, but based on the um, on building footprint. So we're instead of melting them into areas as we would do for for signatures, we're attaching them to the buildings. So it's it's easier to explain some of the insights. So if you're familiar with the geography of Barcelona, the historical Gothic town is around here, and that's ex perfectly captured by the uh, dark blue ta class. Uh, very organic type of development, narrow streets, windy, there's nothing straight, there's no two buildings that are alike. Um, there's been a lot of history going through it and and you can feel it when you walk around it but you can also feel it when you look at their their footprint uh, their uh, morphological signatures and and the type of activities that that happened there the second probably most used most uh, popular or probably arguably the the most popular architectonic or urban planning feature of barcelona is the extension in the 19th century what was called the champla uh, which is here almost perfectly picked up by the uh, red class here. If you come to the uh, image on the right, it's uh, you can see that this is a, a uniform grid of these uh, super blocks that Serda uh, developed in his in his um, plan. And again, the signatures pick it up almost perfectly. Now, what you may know or may not know is that the Champlé was actually. It wasn't a full extension, it's, it's what we would call an infill development in that the uh, core of Barcelona was here and then around the core there were a what it, back then was satellite towns, uh, things like Poble Nou, Poble Sec, um, Gracia here, etc. that had existed before, so had a footprint that was maybe not as old and as an intricate as the Gothic core of the city, but also but but definitely had a longer standing than the extension and and those are picked up again almost perfectly um, through the uh, pinkish category and then in between what we see is um, what Martin started calling these buffer signatures these transition spaces that when you walk through Barcelona the, there's almost never the case that things transition completely from from one class to another there's some in between spaces that are also being being picked up in this case by the yellow um, uh, signature and what we've colored here in green you can see that it's very much Barcelona is in that sense is almost like LA is um, is delimited by the sea on the one hand but it's also delimited on the other hand by by mountains and that's entirely picked up by the um, by the green cluster here 
the green signature, which even though we're not putting, this goes to what I was saying before, even though we're not putting anything to do with terrain, elevation, ruggedness, or any topographic feature, it's picking it up almost, almost perfectly. Okay. Here you have, uh, so that was Barcelona. Here you have Houston on the left and Medellin on the right. I put these two on the same slides because they're the two extremes in the number of clusters that we um, that we find. So again, we don't follow an automatic, I mean, there isn't such thing as an automatic algorithm for determining, or there are, but there, there's always caveats. So we're, we're we're making here an educated guess about what's the most suitable number of clusters. And when we do that analysis in Houston, we find nine categories, nine signatures. When we do that analysis for Medellin, we find 19. So these are the two extremes. And I put these two cities together here because I think in itself, the number of classes is already useful. You can think of Houston as a city that was, you know, I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong and my partner is going to be very mad because she is from Houston. But in the 1950s, Houston probably had less than 100,000 uh, people or, or definitely less than half a million. Today has over 6 million people, the metropolitan area that's being mapped here. So it's a city that's been completely invented and, and fully developed since the the technology of the car came to get, came came around and and the post war war sub suburban development emerged and that type of development in the literature sometimes is equated to um, a process of homogenization homogenization not a lot of detail not a lot of richness in the um, type of morphology that it uh, it generates and how also in how it allocates functions in the ways that it's, it's relatively regular and and the idea that we find less classes and less signatures would, would seem to point towards that you find SWATs even though the maps look similar if you can I don't know if you can read through the slide the scale uh, this line here in this black line here is 25 kilometers in Houston is five kilometers in the Medellin map so the area in Houston that's represented is massive, is very, very large. On the right hand side, what we have is Medellin, which is a city that has a much longer lineage and history that has been that's been built through many more historical periods, and that it also has a very particular topography. So even though you can't really see it here, um, Medellin is kind of at the bottom or the center is at the bottom of a very uh, abrupt valley so most of these areas that again are being picked up almost as perfect gradients they have it's all in slope uh, you may have seen um, some of the probably the most famous architectonic feature or one of the most famous ones in Medellin is the um, the library in one of the um, slums which would be somewhere here um, that's very much on a on a slope and again, we're not putting any information around um, around topography, but it's all being picked up because that is encoded. It's one of the things that gets encoded in um, in in form and function when you when you put it together. And then the final one, another example of how not topography but history gets encoded in. Um, in a city and in, in how we structure form and function. On the left, you have Singapore, uh, old colonial city that has then since uh, grown s substantively. You can also tell that there is uh, a signature for the old colonial town and then another one or, or different ones for the um, different waves of development that kind of grew the city into the massive uh, monolith that is that is today. And then on the right hand side, the main story on Dar es Salaam in Tanzania is how relatively well, given how difficult this, this is, it picks up formal settlement versus informal settlement, how it picks up classes, even though, and this is a, a type of development that it is very abrupt. Maybe all of you have seen this, the famous picture of Sao Paulo where there's a, a luxury condo building right next to a favela. That is very abrupt change of form, function, and almost anything else that you can think of. 
Something similar happens in, in, in other cities of the developing world where informal settlement uh, slums occur right next to other types of very much planned settlements. And, and th that seems to be also picked up in, in the signatures that we develop um, for, for the city. So that's a bit of a whirlwind tour through the illustration. I wanted to make sure that I don't overrun on time too much, at least, um, just so we have a, a, at least a little bit of time for questions and, and comments. So if you have to leave the call, uh, do it right after this slide. Uh, if, if you really have to go, these are the what I think are the, the three key takeaway messages um, for you to walk out of this Zoom room um, around this this talk. The first one is hopefully from the beginning, but throughout the talk, I've I've made clear that form and function is is really important. It's really important because it encodes many other things, everything from geography to history to culture. But it's also important, so we can learn a lot by looking at form and function, but it's also important because it influences a whole host of other outcomes, anything from sustainability to economic productivity. And what we're hoping to to, uh, to bring with this spatial, with the idea of the spatial signatures is, is uh, this idea of form and function for cities in detail and at scale. It's, it's almost, that's really what we're trying to do. There's a lot of details and a lot of uh, devil in the detail, but at the end of the day, we're trying to package up form and function with a focus on cities in a way that's detailed, but that also scales. And we're doing this because at the end of the day, we, we firmly believe that if you're able to measure and characterize form and function better in ways that scale and that are more comparable, we can get a, a lot of understanding about how cities work, how cities change, and how the things that make cities great places for productivity, for uh, really for being a human being, for being almost anything that we as humans do and, and are, um, understanding form and function better can make us understand better why cities make us be better humans. And I think with that, I'm going to uh, leave it at that.